You're listening to The Frankie Files. FrankieFilesPodcast.com Over the past 19 years, the International Human Trafficking and Social Justice Conference has welcomed thousands of attendees from all 50 states and from 47 countries. We are the largest and oldest academic conference on human trafficking in the world. Our 19th annual conference will be hosted virtually this year on September 21st through the 23rd. You will have the opportunity to learn from and collaborate with thousands of advocates, researchers, providers, and survivors from across the globe. This will be our largest conference to date with over 110 breakout sessions featuring 175 expert presenters speaking about various topics related to human trafficking and social justice issues. Make sure you are part of the conversation and don't miss out. Find out more and register today on our website, traffickingconference.com. Trigger warning. Some people may find topics discussed in this episode difficult. Please proceed with caution. Today, Frankie Files podcast has another incredible guest. We'll explore the arena of human trafficking from a 30-year expert in the field, in the state of Ohio, but also federally. Let's talk about this powerhouse. Celia is a distinguished university professor of social work and director of the Human Trafficking and Social Justice Institute. Williamson is well known for her community advocacy against human trafficking and domestic violence, along with her extensive research into the issue. She organizes the annual International Human Trafficking and Social Justice Conference of University Toledo that has welcomed people from 49 states and 40 countries since it began in 04, as they work to advance collaborative research, advocacy, and program development. She also studies prostitution, vulnerable women, and drug abuse. Her expertise is in human trafficking and prostitution. She's been in the news at the Academic Minute, The Conversation, The Tamron Hall Show, and Toledo Blade, to name a few. She founded the first anti-trafficking program in 93 in Ohio and directly worked with victims in Toledo for several years. She has completed numerous federally funded studies, written several articles and reports, edited or contributed to four books on sex trafficking, and completed a memoir of her experience as an anti-trafficking advocate. Additional accomplishments include founding the Lucas County Human Trafficking Coalition, chairing the Research and Analysis Subcommittee for the Ohio Attorney General's Human Trafficking Commission, and serving as president of the Global Association of Human Trafficking Scholars. In 2015, she became the director of the Human Trafficking and Social Justice Institute at the University of Toledo to further the mission of combating human traffic through research, education, and engagement. Dr. Williamson teaches social work practice and human trafficking courses. She also produces a podcast called The Emancipation Nation. The Frankie Files. We're here talking with Silly Williamson, and I wanted to start with uh, talking about the R. Kelly sex trafficking case trial. You had some amazing comments, and that's how we met, as I told you in the interview you did of me. Yeah. Um, you wrote an article on Yahoo News. How did that come about? How did you decide to write that article? And what was that about? Tell our listeners. Yeah, well, I, you know, I watched the R. Kelly documentary and to me it made total sense in terms of I do human trafficking research and advocacy and policy work and have worked directly with victims of human trafficking uh, particularly sex trafficking mm -hmm. for almost 30 years. So when I saw um, R. Kelly and how he recruited and how mm -hmm. he spoke to them and how he manipulated and then controlled, it was chapter, yeah. rhyme, and verse of what typically happens as sex traffickers manipulate and maneuver vulnerable people into positions. Now, R. Kelly 
he certainly used all the tools of the trade to manipulate them into okay. positions where he had all the power and control. And the victims were getting chastised by his fans. Oh, yeah, absolutely. For he was doing the same thing to us as society that he had done to his victims. We, he was grooming us. He was making mm. us fall in love with his music. He was making us identify with him. So that even back in the day when he married Aaliyah at 15 years old, somehow we told ourselves that's not okay mm -hmm. everywhere else. But in this instance, I guess it's okay. And that's how you get manipulated. That's how you get pulled in. And so now that he, mm -hmm. he was facing mm -hmm. criminal charges and was convicted, I didn't want people to be confused on what was happening so that we could come out of this fog of we like mm. R. Kelly and see it for what it is because this master manipulation has to stop. And so I just wrote a very clear article, hopefully to, to shake some people out of this uh, romance they had with this person who was um, really abusive and exploitive um, to children. Absolutely. And it was clear. It was so clear. It resonated so loudly. And as a victim of coercive manipulation myself, it really is something that I <laughs> had to contact you over because it, it was like, wow, she's singing my song. Yeah. Pun intended. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you were, you were even says stop in the actual name of love and care for children that got manipulated by him. I had to stop and put it, put the tablet down and go, ooh, amen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, and and then when I met you, I thought, this is an amazing podcast yeah. and what an amazing story. And to be able to share Thank your you. experience and to help people, you know, the first thing we have to do is talk about it and we have to, you know, lift the shade and, and, and see things for what they are. And so you're having conversations that are difficult conversations as well, and we need more people who are willing to say, I'm not going to be romanced by whatever fog you think is going on. We need to, we can't say children are so precious and then excuse when people do it in the name of religion, when people mm -hmm. do it in the name of entertainment and music, uh, talents like that, you still have to yeah. see it for what it is. It's like society makes these leaders gods. Yes. And then when they do things like sexual abuse or trafficking, it's it's hard to reconcile. Well, but they're a god. How can I blame them? They just feel the power or yeah. all these excuses. Yeah. And it is amazing to see because like I, sp I thought so many years about speaking out. And now that I'm beginning to, the victim shaming is out here slapping us in the face oh yeah saying well you why didn't you fight back why didn't you leave right why didn't you see it coming right <laughs> it's like it you know we know absolute power corrupts absolutely and so everybody mm -hmm. should be held in check i mean there was a few years ago we convicted three pastors for sex trafficking and why did that happen because mm -hmm. everybody in the congregation just kept Going along, every time the envelope was pushed a little bit more, they just kept figuring out in their minds how that was okay. And mm. what we need to do is we need to stand up, show up, and speak up. And we need to understand we are here to protect children. And I don't care your gender and power. I need to speak up. And that's what we need mm -hmm. to start doing. So in this case you're speaking of, which was religious, was that in Ohio? Yeah, that was in Toledo, Ohio. Three pastors um, that trafficked a few young people under 18, uh, teenagers, in their church and mm -hmm. um, took them to motels, you know, had sex with them in the church. It was, it was ridiculous. And mm -hmm. people saw things and people knew things and people felt uncomfortable at times, but you know, no one for a very long time 
decided they had enough power inside themselves to stand up and speak out. And that's what happens mm. in the R. Kelly case. Okay, um, maybe I'd like to blame the parents for sending the child to R. Kelly. Right. But look, we yeah. have a lot of Olympic hopefuls. We have a lot of people who have dreams of being in the entertainment industry. We have a lot of parents that can't afford to travel alongside their child. Are you going to be the person that steps up and kills your child's dream? The Frankie Files. I mean, mm -hmm. we're looking for somebody to blame. We want to blame the parents. Mm -hmm. We want to say to the kids oftentimes, or the women, why didn't you just leave? Why didn't you just see it? Why didn't you just run? While we are at the nightclub dancing to the very song of the child molest. You know, how can we ask somebody to do something <laughs> we are unwilling to do? That's a loop that needs to be broken. Yes, and that... The silence loop. Exactly, and that's why I, I call it mm. shooting the wounded, because when you mm -hmm. blame the very people who are victimized, that's when we know we're going down the wrong path. We need to embrace them. We need to understand their stories. We need to remove the stigma and place the accountability where it should be placed. That's really hard for people to grapple with Yeah, um, that haven't experienced this. I notice it's kind of like automatic. Well, you know, why did they listen? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I would like to say to those people, like you say, like your message in your position is, you know, what What part did we have in this exactly. as society? Why do we normalize exactly. these activities? I mean, a, a pimp doesn't have a much different story than a religious cult leader exactly. or R. Kelly to, to woo me, right? Yeah. You're going to be important. You're going to learn from me. You're going to be set up in this industry, whatever. Mm -hmm. You are important. Important. Absolutely. I was told that. Yeah, you are important. Mm -hmm. And see, when we as a society collude, you know, we're colluding with these people. And so we can't look at it that way mm -hmm. because we have to blame ourselves. We're mad at the butcher in some sense, but we've been fattening the pig. You know, we've been participating, mm -hmm. but we don't want to. It's, it's natural for people not to look at their part, to look at themselves. So let me look for somebody right. to blame. Well, who's easy to blame? The vulnerable person is easy to blame. So let me kick somebody <laughs> while they're down. That is such a bad habit. Yes, and that's what we I do. can't believe it's so normal. So normalized. Thirty years you've been seeing this type of behavior. You've been seeing the pimp line. Yes. That go into the prostitution on the streets. Yes. The the various teen vulnerability in Ohio trafficking, you work with the attorney general there. Yes. What's the nature of this type of work? Do you work with the laws? How does that work? Yeah, we work to pass uh, three state laws, uh, one federal law, and thousands. We didn't want to protect one at a time anymore. We wanted to protect the multitude of not only kids, but of vulnerable adults as well. And then we wanted to say to criminal justice and the attorney general and all the law enforcement people that it's not really all about this. We're grateful that you might rescue somebody. We're grateful that we have laws in place to protect people. We're grateful. But this is about so much more. This is about human rights. It's about human dignity. It's not just about arresting people. It's not just about passing laws. And it's not just about mm -hmm. rescuing because we will rescue until the end of time. We have to change the way we think about and treat children. We have to change the way we think about and treat women. We have to change the way we think about vulnerable people, no matter what their gender, sexual orientation, because once people have human rights, then they have dignity and they can access certain systems we we give them voice when we do that we don't want to just mm -hmm. continue to rescue and, uh, and arrest perpetrators and that that's a reactive way to address it and we need to be proactive 
So proactive involves um, getting knowledge to regular public Absolutely. and how trafficking actually takes place. And I think there's a large amount of ignorance. Mm-hmm. I think people think, oh, this is trafficking must be something that happens near the border. Yeah, exactly. And that's we've been sensitizing people to that issue for a very long time. You know, in, the, in 2000, our government passed the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. And that was really the first Mm -hmm. federal law to say, we have human trafficking victims on U.S. soil. And they are being um, exploited in the sex trade and the labor trade. And so when we talk Mm -hmm. about sex trafficking, it's really someone who is victimized, who is in the sex industry, who's victimized through force, fraud, or coercion. That is the federal law. And that's a felony Mm -hmm. crime. Or if there's anybody under the age of 18 in the U.S., you cannot consent to sell yourself sexually uh, when you're under 18. Now, if there's no force, fraud, or coercion, Mm -hmm. then you are involved in prostitution, which this country says is a misdemeanor crime. Now, in my mind, Mm -hmm. you know, that's the criminal justice law. That's the criminal justice perspective. In my mind, it's a lot more complicated than that. When we see women in street level prostitution Mm -hmm. they look very similar to women that have been trafficked in the sex trade in terms of poverty violence Mm -hmm. uh, poor mental health outcomes post-traumatic stress disorder drug addiction that they look very similar so we don't care Mm -hmm. if this person is meeting the definition of the law or not we want to reach out and help them Now, there's also Mm -hmm. then the whole issue of um, sex work, which there are lots of feminists that are involved in sex work that fight for their rights uh, to be sex workers. Mm -hmm. There's um, this issue going on between, for the sake of argument, women involved in um, the sex trade, the commercial sex trade. And so some Mm -hmm. people see that as women being exploited through the sex trade. And some people see that as women being empowered to choose uh, sex work as a profession. And so it's uh, a lot more complicated than, you know, just sex trafficking. There's the sex industry is very complicated in all kinds of perspectives about it. Yeah. Well, single moms are one of the targets in this industry, if I'm not mistaken, for human trafficking, for sex trafficking. So Mm -hmm. vulnerable because their kids are then vulnerable, too. And there's no man really to, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) defend them physically. Yeah. So I can imagine that the numbers are really high with single moms. Yeah, single moms. um, the, The key to... It all is really vulnerability when we're talking about sex trafficking. What, how mm-hmm. are you vulnerable? And that's how that person will show up in your life to fill that vulnerability. We know that single moms are right. paid less um, wages than other people, or they may be relegated to service industry jobs. And so they're very, they have right. very real basic needs, um, you know, food, housing, right. shelter. They need support. And sometimes people will step yeah. up as a, you know, air quotes, boyfriend, and then over time, yeah. <laughs> manipulate that person into the sex trade. And religion is similar because they'll step up as an answer to a system to raise the kids in. You get to know all these other families mm-hmm. or whatever. And then pretty soon you're manipulated into a situation where either the parent or the children are going to be initiated into some sexual cult that's inside Mm -hmm. religion itself. Exactly. And and I mean, what's the difference between a pimp and a religious leader? Well, not very much, because let me tell you, pimps, pimps have a lot of rules that you have to follow. There is a code that you have to follow. And this has been handed down from generation, uh, generation pimp to generation. So much like religion, there are rules. That victim has to walk lockstep the way that that pimp says that life should be conducted. That's the way that that vulnerable person then has to conduct life. 
And so um, there are a lot of similarities in some sense. It does seem like it. And people are starting to get more um, savvy through some of the Scientology cases mm -hmm. that human trafficking does take place in these religious cults oh, yeah. and in self-improvement cults. Oh, yeah. I could totally see that. I could see that because it's about control, isolation, and power. Mm -hmm. Is there even laws in place or is it still kind of a hands-off or religious trafficking? Mm -hmm. Well, in human trafficking. Yeah, the way that we can get around um, some of the religious protections is to build the elements of a trafficking case. So if there are um, any sect that uh, meets the elements of human trafficking, then can be charged with that crime. And what are those elements? Is that too much to ask? Well, there has to be, of course, force, fraud, or coercion. And there are, okay. and it can get, it's exactly what the federal law says, uh, but mm -hmm. there has to be means, motive, and those types of things, and it can get very complicated. But in the U.S., we have federal task forces that are specific to human trafficking and then every state has passed laws against human trafficking so sometimes i hadn't thought of it before but that that might be a way of advocates who are advocating against religious cults to be able to permeate that mm -hmm. system if they meet those elements i've done some research on this um, it isn't much precedent set in courts mm -hmm. one recently was Nation of Islam, Celia. Mm -hmm. they, were, uh, they were awarded a single plaintiff, the largest uh, amount in time in America, oh, wow. a human trafficking and labor, forced labor for a young woman mm -hmm. who was in for like eight years maybe, and she went to many different locations. School was restricted. I have that too. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, you know, that's a, an element of it is uh, restricting education from mm -hmm, children, mm -hmm. keeping us from getting it. So they were awarded $8 million. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. And it was like, I know it probably was a shot heard around the world because like you were just speaking of, they have to meet the requirements of human trafficking. And what it meant was trafficking and forced labor. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So that's how they were able to win. Now there's a case with Scientology, three plaintiffs who were trafficked from their country to another country after their parents signed a release saying they would be in the Sea Org, which uh -huh. is the children's basically labor camp uh -huh. over there. And they put them on a boat, Celia. They put them on a boat. So that they're out of the laws oh, wow. on land. Yeah. And they've been doing this since the 50s. Their little scam is that they sign a sheet mm -hmm. that says you're uh, in service for a billion years. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I'm pretty curious to follow. I'm following the one uh, that recently got placed against Scientology mm -hmm. back in June or July. Wow. Because this is seeming like our few, one of our fewest options mm -hmm. for cult survivors. Well, you know, I mean, you might have really hit on something here because there are lawyers across this country who are uber passionate about um, human trafficking and may not be as educated on religious cults. But this may be a great way yeah. to meet those elements because when you look at both the issues it's really mm -hmm. about freedom right and, uh, and america is very passionate about people being able to live free we've been working yes. with um lawyers that are taking on these cases without people having money without people having a lot of money they're just passionate and this mm -hmm. is their pro bono case so um, mm -hmm. we have a, a number of attorneys going after hotels at this point who are profiting um, okay. from sex trafficking. So it's just another, that's a, that's a great lens um, to look at this issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Over the past 19 years, the International Human Trafficking and Social Justice Conference has welcomed thousands of attendees from all 50 states and from 47 countries. We are the largest and oldest academic conference on human trafficking in the world. Our 19th annual conference will be hosted virtually this year on September 21st through the 23rd. You will have the opportunity to learn from and collaborate with thousands of advocates, researchers, providers, and survivors from across the globe. This will be our largest conference to date with over 110 breakout sessions featuring 175 expert presenters speaking about various topics related to human trafficking and social justice issues. Make sure you are part of the conversation and don't miss out. Find out more and register today on our website, traffickingconference.com. The Frankie Files. It, it's so new, and I know that lawyers, you know, often have to go with precedent that's set, so it's tough to be the groundbreaking mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. case, but I hope there will be more. I yeah. really got my eye on this. Oh, my gosh. Because like that would be, you know, my statute of limitations has passed mm -hmm. and many people's has. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I can help someone else yeah, to, to you know, in any way. Um, Absolutely. So with your 30 years experience, you've been seeing these patterns mm -hmm. repeat over and over and over. Mm -hmm. What is your main message to the public in your position and with the knowledge you have so far? What's your main message to the public about trafficking? Well, in terms of sex trafficking, very much like, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, um, I like the message also mm -hmm. that children's lives matter. And many people say, well, of course, of course mm -hmm. they do. And I say no. And in fact, for several years, um, it was not the trafficker, a.k.a. pimp, or the customer. They got a slap on the wrist. I promise you they were right, right back out of jail. It was the 14-year-old mm -hmm. and the 15-year-old that we stigmatized, we punished, we incarcerated, and we called that person the person that was the center of the crime. She was 14, and maybe she was sold to a 30-year-old by a 40-year-old, wow. and the adults were not held accountable until around mid-2000s when the state started passing the laws to say, wait a minute, this child is a victim of abuse, not a juvenile mm -hmm. delinquent that is seducing these men. Mm -hmm. So my message is children's <laughs> lives matter. And even if they come to you in packages that are very defensive, their language is horrible, yeah. you, you have to understand behind that tough exterior, first of all, that was created for survival purposes. Thank God it was created. And I'm glad that they come very tough yeah. because that's how you survive. But behind that is a very soft child who just wants to be loved in a wholesome way by people who care about them. And I would say that the women we see are the children we missed. And so we bear some responsibility. The women we see are the children we missed. Absolutely. Oh, wow. So, so true. Mm -hmm. If we can get generations from experiencing that. Yes. That's something. And I know your work is so extensive. With the 19th Annual Human Trafficking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Conference coming mm -hmm. up, how did this conference come about? That's a long time running. Oh, well, now you're going to make me tell, tell on myself because let me tell you how it started. Mm -hmm. Tell me. So in 2004... I was saying to myself, you know, we're doing some stuff here in the community and I know other people are doing things all over the country and like what we need to get together. So what do you call? Oh, oh, that, oh mm -hmm. that's called a conference. OK, well, let's have one and we're going <laughs> to call it a national conference. And okay. the people around me said, well, wait a minute, we can't just call something a national conference and then just do it. And I said, why not? Why can't we like who? has elected us or who has legitimized us to do it. I said, I did. So there you go. Yeah. And 
That's how stuff gets That's done. That's how stuff gets really done, for real. Go, Celia. So uh, they said, well, I don't, I don't know about that. I said, well, I'll get a student because I'm a university professor, so I can find students. Hey, student, do you know how to build a website? Okay, build a website. Say we're having a national conference, and the student did. Mm-hmm. And then I went around, and I made copies uh, I put a program together. I made copies at the university. Mm-hmm. I went around to all my friends and all their social service programs. And I asked them, hey, how many yeah. copies can you make before you get in trouble? And we'll make these copies. <laughs> and then and then people came from all the across country. the country. We didn't pay these people. We didn't, oh. we didn't even buy their hotel rooms. And they came mm-hmm. and... My mother and my sister cooked uh, delicious food for them for lunch, <laughs> and they were at the university, mm-hmm. and the university came over, and they said, well, wait a minute. You can't just have people cook. You, <laughs> you have to get a caterer. You have to. And I said, oh, okay. Well, I didn't know. I didn't know. And so um, then people said, well, you got to do this <laughs> next year. You got, And I thought, oh, my God, I don't know if I have the energy. And so 19 years later, <laughs> um, <laughs> this is the... The, really the largest academic conference on human trafficking in the world. Wow. That's a great story. <laughs> it's amazing because I know that, you know, there is always the rule followers. Yes. And then there's people that go, well, we're going to make some new rules like you said. Absolutely. Well, the university <laughs> finally came over three years later and they were like, who, who yeah. gave you permission to do this? I said, nobody. <laughs> I, I just did it. Are we? Am I supposed to ask for permission? Oh, I didn't know, but I did know. That's what I'm talking about right that's here. That's right. That's right. So now they're very. Everyone's going. Who gave you permission? I did. I did, and so. Well, I'm a professor. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Using your position for something good. That's right. Wow. So this is a real meeting of minds of people in this activism. Yes. Yes, and the people come together. Fabulous. We have about 110 presentations. We have had representatives from 46 con- 47 countries, all 50 states. It's a, it's a massive okay. conference. We cover every topic known to man uh, that focuses on human trafficking or uh, social justice issues. We have, um, we really try to... Hmm push the envelope. So we really ask people to go to those that they're really curious about or that they know something about or they agree with the presenter. But then go to one that that makes you stretch yourself, that maybe you don't agree with that position. But you say, I'm going to go and I'm going to sit there respectfully and I'm going to learn. And at the end of that talk, I'm going to say to myself, that's exactly why I don't agree with you but I understand your argument now. Or I go to that session and I say, wow, I've Mm -hmm. got to expand my brain to incorporate this new learning. Either way, that's what a conference, that's what makes it academic to challenge your existing thoughts. It's not a political conference where everybody comes and everybody agrees and everybody goes home and everybody lives in their little bubble. This is stretching you to learn. So we'll have... Uh, a, a former pimp who might tell you what he's what he was thinking, what he was doing, how he was yeah. doing it. We might have your traditional researchers. We'll have survivors talking about their experience. We'll have people that developed mm. programs, people that passed laws, and and we'll have a few that you'll say, "Wow, I can't believe they're having that conversation." But okay, because. Um, <laughs> you need to know. And so we're having someone who molested children talk about mm. what did you do? What were you thinking? What is the pathway out of this? What is the recovery? And is there any recovery? Wow. And, you know, it's... You guys are going hard in the paint. Yeah, we are, because you have to know. You have <laughs> to know. So it's cross-pollinating solutions and knowledge in all areas of human trafficking. Yeah, and we have about 10 continuing education units, so people who are lawyers and and social workers and counselors. and So we have a lot of uh, continuing education that they can use to keep their license, yeah. 
So you're teaching teachers and practitioners. Absolutely. Along with students and stay-at-home moms and anybody who's really, really saying okay. that I, I want to learn. I want to be a part of the solution. Fabulous. Well, I'm going to attend. Now, who attends for free? I saw yes. this asterisk about survivors. Yeah. How does that work? Our survivors of human trafficking. So anybody that's a survivor of human trafficking can attend our conference for free. We have mm. discounts for students that are at um, various universities, um, college students. Okay. So, yeah, we aimed, wow. and I think the entire conference is probably... At this point, after the early bird special, it's probably, I think, $249 for the entire conference. Okay. Yeah. And then do, do you recognize kids trafficked through cults as victims? Uh, I can't answer that because if I did, my conference planner would probably have to kill me, but um, I would. <laughs> <laughs> they could go through the website. Yeah. They could go through the website. Yeah, and then she will make that determination. Okay. But... Yes, Got and it. I and and if you come to the conference, you have three weeks, up to three weeks after the conference to watch those sessions that you really wanted to watch, but uh, you were in the other room watching the other one you really wanted to watch. <laughs> well, I want to cover. I want to attend your lecture for starters. Yeah, yeah. The website has all this information, mm -hmm. but I believe there's a cutoff registration September thirteenth. So people should act now. Yeah. Uh, it's taking place mid-September. Yes, it's September 21st to the 23rd, and September 13th, right, is the is the end date for registration. So, yeah, if you're considering okay. it, uh, you know, register before that. It's a wonderful, people feel connected around the world uh, when they come to the conference. Well, this is, um, you know, this is right up my alley. Uh, it was a realization that I had about 2015, about a year after I decided to start looking into my history, mm -hmm. to put together that I was trapped. It really was a shock. Yeah. And no one told me. I just started putting together, like, trafficking isn't quite what I thought. Mm -hmm. It's not just going around the world. It could be local. Oh, absolutely. It could be, um, as a professional on this topic, what is the criteria for, it's not about distance, no, no, right? No, absolutely not. No. No. It's, it's, the word is trafficking. It sounds like there's movement that has to take place, but you don't have to take anyone across state lines. They can be mm -hmm. living in a home, be trafficked in that home, mm -hmm. on that neighborhood, and never leave the block. It's not about that. It's about um, right. um, trading, sexual services, sexual favors, and someone benefits there's often a third party that benefits from that. So if you're in a cult or so, I could imagine um, you being controlled and there's some fraud in place because we love you. We're here to just teach you right. and have you follow the ways right. of, you know, the Lord and those types of things. But there's fraud that happens. Mm -hmm. And then right. you become sexual, not because of your own choice, even though in some no. cases with our victims, they believe that they have made a choice to do this. And most of these cases, you have not. You have been manipulated and positioned right. into these spaces. Right. And so in some right. sense, if that person benefits, okay, I'm using this girl, woman, um, to have sex with me or anybody of my choosing, I can keep other people in compliance, in places of compliance. That is my benefit. Mm -hmm. So. In those senses, there may not be money passed, but it doesn't always have to be money passed. And we might not see the money passed, too. Yeah. And then there's questions often for me, what films were made that I don't know about? Yeah. And where did they get passed around? As you know, yeah. that's a thing they do. Yes. So, yes. yeah, there's so much ways to market a person that's you that you've been slaved. Yeah, and you can hide behind. All the ways. Yeah, you can hide behind <laughs> religious freedom and, and, and try to yeah. do that, but... Now that we have FBI task forces, I'm I'm very happy about mm -hmm. them in that sense that they have uh, yeah. endless money and <laughs> ways yeah. to yeah. investigate things that other people, local police, can't. So yeah, it was such a pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah.
and we are all looking forward to this conference. Uh, you must be so busy preparing yes, yes, for the conference. Yes. I better let you go. Yeah, I feel the pressure just being with you here. Thank you, Sister Warrior, because I appreciate it. And of course, I would take mm -hmm. the time. Of course, I would take the time because the work <laughs> you are doing is so critical. And we don't have many in that space. And so we need you. Okay. And I'm so happy that you're here and you're doing that hard work. Thank you for uplifting me in this process. This is really supportive. Yeah. Having me on your show. Yeah. Getting your word out. That's what it's about, getting part of this network. So thank you so much. And I look forward to future conversations yeah. and your conference. Awesome. You have a great rest of your day. Sarah. You too. Thank you so much, Frankie. I'll be launching the use of a new hashtag, Occupy Cults. Occupy Cults certainly speaks for itself. It's time that we get the word out about the damage these cults do financially, emotionally, psychologically, sexually, generationally. And that's part of what prompted me to begin speaking out. The hashtag Occupy Cults should be placed on anything you want the awareness raised on. I notified the press my list that I use, and I hope that it will help them find stories to raise the awareness and to disseminate this information even more widely than it is now. So check out the hashtag Occupy Cults. Wear it on a t-shirt. Chalk it on the neighborhood. Get the word out. Occupy Cults means just that. Pay attention to what's going on. Those survivors who are trying to speak out need your support. It's extremely difficult for us. So thanks for listening and uh, check out Occupy Cults, the hashtag. The Frankie Files. You're listening to The Frankie Files. FrankieFilesPodcast.com